Hey there and welcome to That Beer Show. It's our goal here at That Beer Show to show you the passion behind the craft. Everything from beer tastings to distribution to brewing. So without further ado, welcome to our beer tasting segment. I have Ross Richards here today and Ryan Scott. We're going to sample three beers. Today's got a happy theme to it. First beer we're going to start with is Upper Pass Brewing Company. And this is their first drop, and it's their APA American Pale Ale. So is that a skiing reference? Something like that. It could be. I also know with this company that this is actually the first beer that they dropped onto the market. Oh, that's cool. So, so I knew. I think that's kind of nice. uh, where try. that comes from as well. So sweet. So we've already poured. So I will pass that on to you, dude. Thank you. No problem. Cheers. Cheers, gentlemen. Ooh. That smells great. Yeah, big, big citrus fruit. Pretty intense. Oh yeah, nice and nice and pure. Very nice. So clean. Mm -hmm. So this is five point nine percent alcohol and sixty five IBUs. I can't even really taste the alcohol. No, it's uh, it's well done. Especially uh, I love the fact that it's an APA, so American Pale Ale. This seems to be the emerging trend I'm seeing, especially with hoppy beers, is to bring that ABV down to a reasonable strength, mm -hmm. but be able to pack the aromas and taste and flavors that, yeah. in. So this was dr double dry hopped, excuse me, uh, featuring Azeka, Centennial, Mosaic, and Citra hops. Interesting combination. Yeah. yeah. You got a little bit of the fruitier ones and some of the you know more subtle ones as well. Yeah, the fruity... Fruity tones definitely show through in the aroma, wouldn't you say? Mm. Another trend. Absolutely. Another trend here with these style of beers. I wouldn't quite call this a New England IPA, but pretty close. Um, is Maybe the fact that it's month. that it's not bitter. You no. know, and we've talked no. about this on other shows. It's you're packing in all those hop flavors and aromas without it being overly bitter, um, as opposed to a West Coast IPA, which is really yeah. in your face bitterness. Exactly. And I bring that up too. For folks out there, you know, another theme of ours is to try something new, especially when you go to a bar. Don't be afraid of IPAs. Don't go into a bar thinking that you won't like it, especially hoppy beers, because hoppy beers are not really that bitter anymore. It's, I agree. And that's what a lot of people didn't, didn't care for is the bitterness. They actually liked the hop component, mm -hmm. but didn't like the bitterness, Absolutely. but it just kind of got labeled as hoppy beers. Um, so, you know, something like this, I think a lot of folks, even people who don't think they like IPAs, would probably enjoy uh, a beer like this. So I tried an IPA, I would say when I first turned 21, I tried an IPA. And honestly, I won't say what brewer it came from, but honestly, I didn't really care for it. Yeah. That was early in my beer drinking days. Yep. But I do find that the flavors are so much more balanced and, uh, well, they're better executed now. I think of, you know stone IPAs mm -hmm. which are delicious mm -hmm. um, but you know they were really all about west coast big multi-body yeah. bitterness um, which I do love um, on occasion um, but this this northeast north you know New England style IPAs are really I think taking over and the big trend of those are you know not a lot of bitterness is that what you're how you'd categorize a New England IPA, the the bitterness factor, or is there another way that you would do that? There's a lot of different components to it. Um, one would be low bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, another would be hazy, cloudy. Yeah, yeah. Another would be big, big aroma. So they're probably standard. It'd be a dry hopped beer, standard? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yep. The body of them isn't overly done, even for a haze it has, though. That's a good point, you know? yeah. Like, you get a lot of session IPAs. It's lighter body, real big hops. This... 
to me, it's, it's it's a very good APA style because it still has some body and some hop that that are you know they play well together yeah. mm-hmm. rather than That's all malt point. or all yeah. hop. Well, it's interesting too. Like we're, it's a pale ale, and they're calling it a pale ale, and mm-hmm. I think it's a pale ale, but. If you drank this oh, beer, that's right. As opposed to an IPA, if you drank this beer IPA. six years ago, that it would be an IPA. It would be almost a double yeah. IPA in terms of its aroma and yeah. strength. Um, so you know the it's, whole the style is changing. Yeah, as we said recently, pale ales are not necessarily dry hopped, but they can be. They can be. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Were you gonna say something? Yeah, I, one of the things that fascinates me about this one in particular is like the hop level in it. Like we were saying earlier, it's it's a fruity flavors, yeah. not bitterness. No, you know, mm-hmm. and this one really captures a lot of the fruit in it. It does, yeah. you know. Yeah, you get a little a little mango, a little pineapple. Yeah. So almost like a session double IPA, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does, you know. It does. It, it drives me crazy, but it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. I mean, there's it, it is it's a crazy world when it comes to these kind of IPAs. You yeah. know, you can have a session double IPA, right. which is just confusing. Yes, but you can get that yeah. hop. Aroma. What about a session barley wine? Oh, uh, no, I know. I, know, I, know, I, know, I just got you. I got oh, you. I man. Love I love it. Greetings! Today we're talking beer glasses, and in particular, sample glasses. Why a sample glass? Sample glasses are invaluable. Especially when you're having five, six, seven friends over to drink a beer. How are you going to get all that beer into the appropriate size glass? Hence, the sample glass. The sample glass that I have today is actually called a beer can sample glass, which is, in my opinion, one of the best sample glasses out there. This one itself has actually a four ounce pour line. So the most uh, common format these days is the 16 ounce can. So if you have a 16 ounce can, four ounces, three glasses, you can certainly do the math. Um, Work very well. This one in particular, I like due to the size and also the beveled edge up top. Works awesome for aroma, for swirling, and for actually just drinking the beer itself. There's all kinds of sample glasses out there. There's the tulip sample glass, uh, the Pilsner sample glass. So just like you know any other beer glass that you may have out there, there's a mini version of that, if you will. Love the tulip. Love this one. Don't love the small pint glass. You know, you, you know how I feel about pint glasses. Um, so oftentimes these will come with a paddle as well. So you can get you know four glasses and a paddle. It's kind of cool when you're serving your friends to bring it out that way. Uh, but if you don't have a collection of sample glasses, go out and get yourself some. Again, they're invaluable, pretty sturdy. You know, they're not going to break in the dishwasher or whatever. So uh, if you don't have some, go out and get yourself some today. We're going to actually move on to a brewery out of Maine. So we're going to have to spend an episode just talking about Maine beers, I think, because they're really exploding and blowing it up. This is a a smaller brewery. It's called Battery Steel. 
and this cool is name. their Flume Double IPA. I do know a little bit about this beer, which I'll share as I pour. Um, this beer is brewed with mosaic and citra lupulin powder. Oh, very oh. interesting. Very so missing lupulin powder we, uh, last time. Pretty looking beer right there. Nice yellow tones. There you are. Nice and golden. It is a nice cold. And once again, it's hazy, probably from being dry hopped and the lupin, lupulin powder, right? Yeah, lupulin powder will definitely hang in there. So Ooh. also one thing I didn't touch upon on the Damn. New England style, um, which is a big component, is the yeast itself. Ah, uh, that makes sense. So they actually use yeasts that don't necessarily Damn. fall out of suspension. So I got to catch up to you guys on this. Oh yeah, dank. Yeah, dank, dank and dank, pungent dank, are, the, are yeah. the words to describe this particular... That could be a beer right there, dank and pungent. I like that. We don't, should write that down. Yeah, don't take that. Remember that. Copyright. So yeah, the lupulin powder. Wow. So the, when we sampled a few shows ago, it's it's that same that same taste, that same flavor. But this one's cleaner, I It think. is a little those cleaner, were, actually. Those were awesome, but this one has like a really mellow finish, It I does. Think. It's not quite as... It doesn't grab you right by yeah. the taste buds. Good save there. <laughs> Yeah, that's so a little different aroma from the upper pass. So, so again, just like you said, it is definitely fruity, but with that that dankness mm. underneath. I don't taste a lot of the fruit, though. I mean, it, it seems to be more in the aroma, and then I really taste the lupulin. Powder. Definitely. Was it mosaic lupulin or mosaic and citra? Yeah. Yep. I think there's a good blend of the two different hops in there too, because I can't pull just one flavor, mosaic or citra, out of there. And a lot of times with mosaic, you know mosaic. Exactly. So I, yes. I would even say they're probably leaning a little heavier on the citra uh, side. Yeah. Yeah. Than the mosaic side. IPA. I, but if you look at oh, I'm sorry, I spilled a little bit there. That always happens in beer sampling. I mean, um, I've already sampled some beers. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's seven percent. It's kind of pushing this one. I think is kind of pushing the IPA. At seven yes, percent, that, that's kind of pushing. Yeah. It. Agreed. Um, this that's one, one of those here, beers they could have labeled that double. Wouldn't have argued with them. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of right on that, right on the, the threshold. So yeah, this beer is dank. We'll repeat that. Even well, yes. even as it's just slightly warming up, um, the aroma is just fantastic on it. And I think that's really what lupulin powder brings to the table. Yeah, it's just this fresh picked you just went out in your backyard and picked a hop cone and you know crumbled it up and and smelt it that's really which is very different from picking a hop cone and throwing that in your mouth you don't want to do that yeah i would i would shy away from that <laughs> i think one of the things that we're tasting with the lupulin powders is you're not getting all the extra yes. grass yes. and debris. Yep. I, I, want, I say grass, but I want to call it plant, yeah, plant yeah, yes. material. Vegetal, I think Veg they, you know, yes. they call it like that a lot. Just, like, just unnecessary that. added weight and like added that. ingredients when plant really, too. Yep. I mean, what we want out of the hops as brewers is mm -hmm. this really is 30% of right. that total cone. Exactly. And that's what this is, is they take that and condense it for you. I tell We're people that a lot, ingredient. especially is, you know, I always say, oh, lupulin powder, They're like, what the heck is that? A lot of people don't know, and we're probably repeating ourselves here, but the hop cone is literally just a vessel to bring that lupulin to the beer. Yes. It's not necessary. It's not needed in the brewing process. A lot of times it's not even wanted, like Ross alluded to. Mm. Um, especially for brewers, if we can get uh, you know, all that lupulin from you know, one pound of powder, where it may take three or four pounds of pelletized hops mm -hmm. or seven or eight pounds of whole cone hops, we want that powder. Yeah. Um, one, you're gonna get a lot more beer at the end of the day. You're not getting sure. all that extra trub and, and, and matter and such. So this is something I just started catching on and I have a feeling something we're gonna be talking about for, for many years to come. It may be I, one of those products that revolutionize how beer is brewed. I won't be surprised also if another version of lupulin powder is yep. like an, maybe another process to yep. extract that from the cones yeah there i think something else will be soon on the horizon i agree i'm glad you brought that up I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that so at madison's we've experimented with lupulin powder um we had mixed results mm -hmm. honestly um but then we switched over to lupulin powder pellets that makes sense so they take the actual powder and pelletize it and we found in our process that it works a lot better um in terms of mixing with the beer and actually throwing the components maybe that the you density. want it to. Maybe it's maybe it sinks rather yep. than exactly. form a surface on top of the exactly. beer. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head if yeah. you will. Exactly. All right, like we're going to move on there you go. to 
one of my, I don't want to pull any punches here, but one of my favorite breweries um, out of Massachusetts, Trillium. So we're going to sample their double dry hopped scaled. I know that Scaled was the first beer that they brewed in their new brewery in Canton, Mass. Oh, look at the color. It looks like pineapple, like fresh pineapple juice. Um, these folks are doing things with beer and hops that I don't even know what they're doing. I think they have uh, Harry Potter there or something doing some, <laughs> some secret spells in the back but because it's really unbelievable the kind of flavors and aromas that they're pulling out of these hops. Now, if I were to watch you pour this, I would swear there's a size on. It's got a yeah, thick at white it. head, almost a Belgian lace on it, and then the the color. Can't even see I through mean, it. that. Very interesting. Cannot see through that. No, no, that's you know. And another thing that's interesting is four or five years ago, you get a beer like this oh. in a brewery, you're sending it back. <laughs> oh, seriously? Yeah, you're absolutely. Like, there's something wrong with this beer. Is this, it infected? Right. Yeah. Does this look infected? <laughs> exactly. A little shout out to your Facebook world there. Yes. <laughs> so, yep, more more dankness. Damn. What's your reaction? Well, initially, I mean, the, the bubbles get you. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's got a good carbonation level. It's got and a great it, carbonation it level. It carries the flavor down. And I'm not sure if it's the double dry hop, but it, it has a... A, a peculiar hop flavor that you don't normally get in a regular IPA. It's a glass of hops. I mean, like I said, that could be a number of things in their process, mm -hmm. but dry hopping it twice, I mean, I, I'd love to know exactly what they mean by that. Are they dry hopping it for two or three days, pulling that out and throwing in more? Right. Or do they leave the original That's in what there? I was yeah. Right. Or are they literally double dry hopping doses wise like this this beer gets oh okay 50 pounds of hops exactly. on the dry is hops. it twice as much so it'd be like brewing coffee now do 100. with twice as much coffee ground matter as right. you normally brew with and again this i i don't mean to diss coffee. these other beers cuz they're delicious beers but Absolutely. there's something about what they're doing with these beers that's a different taste i think you yeah. hit your you, hit, yeah. you know it's a different like you said it's like hops in a glass like mm -hmm. it's it's interesting it's yeah, it almost seems way. to have oh, a an sharp, great way. The, the sharp, bitter undertone yeah. of the West Coast IPAs, but somehow still very East Coast, hazy, That's a good description. fruity, and citrusy. Almost like they they kind of blended East Coast, West Coast, and came up with this insanity. East and West Side. Exactly. <laughs> you, you gents got to give this a serious, serious swirl. I don't have any and room then, here. Let me mix it. And some then room. get your nose in there. Because holy moly. You can say some, you can swear a little bit here. Okay. <laughs> holy damn. Hop damn. No, that's. Hop damn. Ooh, wow, I see what you mean. See, it, it, that's that, a good beer name. Can we that call it Hop damn? Yes. Yeah, when I first smelt this, I'll be honest with you, I was almost like, oh, I'm not really getting a ton. I think it was a little too full, but you get that swirl and. Yeah. The aroma really, that comes out of there is. It's really releasing. Intense. It is. Like oh, camping. Another thing we should talk about is hop burps. Right? You ever drink a hoppy beer? Right? I've had some beers taste better in the burp than drinking it. I don't know I'm if that's a good thing. I don't know, I, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're filtering, out, filtering out the beer or something. You're just burping up hop aroma? That's I, I'm not sure. Like having the coffee reference come back. So that'd be like when you're brewing the coffee at home, maybe some like commercial brand, and it smells great, and then you take that sip and you're like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah. And that's the opposite here, yeah. though. Like... Where honestly, with this beer, it's all good. It but is. with the ones you're referring to, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've been at home before and drank a real hoppy beer like this, and just the burp. And I've had friends around go, oh, "That smells Ooh, good." Right. No idea you just burped. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Oh, what What are you drinking? Hmm. And you're like, mm. uh, "Should I tell him?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Three fabulous beers here. You know, we <laughs> <laughs> we got a winner. Yeah. I, they're, they're all winners they in are. my book. They're Excellent really beers. Are. Um, different styles. Oh, that was nice. Isn't it nice? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we live in Vermont, and we are the most spoiled people in the country because we can literally drive to our local gas station, if you will, That's and true. pick up some Quite of the literally. best beers in the yeah. country. So, um, you yeah. know, when we're sitting here and we're reviewing these beers, you know, take it with a grain of salt. We, we love these beers, but we're also very spoiled. So I don't we, put salt in my beer. No? You never drank a Goza a then, right? Saltarita. Yeah. 
we'll get into that at, at another time. The big takeaway from today's tasting segment is IPAs yeah. are not what they used to be. So please don't judge them by what you think they might be. Go ahead and try one. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. But I have a feeling that you will, especially if you're in New England and you're drinking an IPA. So, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prost. Cheers. Oh, so good. We're here with home brewer Sandy Rhodes at Norton Street Brewing. Hey Sandy, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Ross. So, you've been brewing about 25 years now? 25 years. 25 years. Now, what was your inspiration to get you started on home brewing? I was cheap. Cheap, I, was... I wanted to be able to drink what I wanted to drink, the, the amount, the volumes that I wanted to drink without having to pay the premium price at the store. I had four kids, a wife, all the bills, you know. Yeah, so. Respectable, respectable. I can yeah. see that. Yeah, definitely saves, <clears throat> saves, saves a lot of money. So now, is there anything that you would think is maybe like your brew style? Like what defines you as a home brewer? You know, what's your niche? What's your thing? How do you, Belgians? Uh... Belgians are pretty much my specialty. I, I favor Belgians, but... I spread out amongst the others, IPAs, double IPAs, porters. Very um, good. I'm working on a new size on. Do you remember your first recipe? No. No? I got it written down in Where's a little shot? book 25 somewhere. years is a long time. There's a yeah. lot of homebrewing. <clears throat> so that's a long time ago. What was the homebrew scene like back then? I mean, we're 25 years ago, what was it like? There was just the beginnings of retail support. Um, so was there a lot of options for grains or hop availability? How would you get your stuff? You couldn't get it locally so okay. easy, but online you could order it. And typically I had to order it by the case. So... Yeah, that's definitely changed a lot since then. The local homebrew shops are always there to support the home brewer now. They're everywhere. It's legal in all 50 states. Um, you know, that's just, it's really weird to see that big of a difference. It's impossible not to find what you're looking for now. There's so many options out there. Um, what advice would you have to those who might be interested in starting their own homebrew or to start getting into homebrewing? I would uh, find some mentors, at least one mentor, to uh, get them started, show them how to do it properly. Somebody that brews good beer, whether they're professional or whether they're a home brewer, uh, start with a mentor. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's excellent advice for anybody, anything. I know home brewing for almost all of us, it... It started with an extract kit. You got down to the store. You throw in some quick different things into the boil, and you're stirring it up, and you're throwing your hops. It's really fun. And then the next level from there is going to all grain. It's semi-pro home brewing. And uh, I believe that's what you do here? Yeah, pretty much. All right. So it's, it's big brewing on a small scale, and the availability of the grain have gone through the roof over the last 10 years in particular, the, every, every brew house has all kinds of different grains, and those same grains are now available to everyone at home. The hop scene is exploding. Hops especially. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, have, you have hop yards just like popping up all over New York, Vermont. The hop culture is coming back along with the beer, and I think home brewing and craft brewing, they're hand in hand. They're, they're two peas in the same pod. Well, you even have foreign countries like Germany that's really hopped on, huh, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The hop wagon with a lot of diversity 
in different hops and even within the Hollertau um, hop group, they like uh, Mandarina Barvaria. Now, I, I have to say, when I walked in here, I, I saw the brew house, you know, your kettles and stuff. It, it looks really nice. It, it, it's really awesome. And I think that's, that's one thing I just wanted to emphasize on how much things have changed since 25 years ago with the technology mm -hmm. involved. I know I've seen hop rockets, um, just every gizmo and gadget to, to put more hop flavor in. The hops themselves, you have cryo hops now, you mm -hmm. have lupulin powder, hop hash, just so many different forms of hops at our fingertips now. And uh, is there anything about your equipment that has just changed and helped you dramatically since well, when you first started? I started out like most first timers. I, I brewed my first batch on the kitchen stove and annoyed my wife. She didn't like all the smells and the moisture and everything. And so then I, I uh, moved out to the front porch and I tried it outside a couple of times, once in the rain with a tarp. And I quickly came to the conclusion that this was not the way I really wanted to do yeah. it. I wanted to be indoors. I didn't want to have to worry about wind disrupting my flame on the burner and slowing down my boil and all kinds of things. And so that's why I moved inside. Hey, it, it, it's definitely better to be able to brew inside. I know a lot of us home brewers, they, they don't get to come inside like that. They stay outside. Um, definitely make sure you're using safety and precaution with propane inside of a building. Always make sure you're properly ventilated and you have someone who knows what they're doing, yep. a professional if you can install or set up a homebrew system with propane inside. Um, Anybody locally wants to see how I've done it, they're welcome to get a hold of me and they can come up and check it out. I use a CO monitor to make sure that I'm not gonna poison myself. Yes, oh, <laughs> safety first, definitely safety with homebrewing. Like any other procedure, you know, there's boiling of processes, you gotta be safe. So. It was very nice to be able to come here, see your brewery. Norton Street Brewery seems like a really awesome place to be, an awesome place to hang out. You're a wonderful, wonderful friend, and it was good to have you with us today. Thanks, so, Ross. homebrewers, prost. Cheers. Hey, today we're talking about cans. No, not, not those kind of cans. Beer cans. So beer cans have come a long way, especially in the last five years or so. All of our favorite breweries, big, little, small, in between, are canning beer, which I love. Love the can, perfect format, beach, camping, what have you. One thing I wanna stress about cans is their freshness. Now most, not all, but most breweries will put a canned on date, or at least a best by date. Nothing more than I hate than going in a store, grabbing a four pack of cans, getting it home, drinking a beer. This is a little bit off. Looking on the bottom, it's four months old. So I implore you, when you're going to look um, to buy some cans, look on the bottom. Most cans printed right on there. This one right here, can three weeks ago. This one right here, two weeks ago. If it's not on the can itself, sometimes it's on the bottom, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's up here, sometimes it looks a little awkward, do your best to decipher it. If it's not on the can itself, it's probably on the four pack holder. So again, do yourself a favor, look for a date on the can, make sure it's fresh. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did bringing it to you. We will continue to explore the craft of beer and its unique culture. Till next time, remember, life's too short to drink average beer, drink craft, and be hoppy.